but there's also been a need for from the Israeli side to prepare a pretty large army, many of whom are reservists who are being called up. They also have to decide exactly what their military tactics and objectives are going to be. But then, yes, there's this very big uh, factor of there are about 200 people who are held hostage. William Haig, there's been frantic diplomatic activity. I mean, it's a long while since we've seen this kind of diplomatic dance, I guess you might call it. But has it achieved anything in your view? Well, it, it, of course, it's often hard to tell um, what is achieved immediately. It's very important that it takes place, though, because all channels of communication have to be open. Um, there's a terrible danger of misunderstandings in this situation or of uh, the right people not talking to each other. Now, a lot of that is happening in the region in itself. Of course, mm. even Saudi Arabia and Iran have been talking to each other, which is a good sign of efforts to stop this spreading onto new fronts, so, such, such as on the in the north with, in, um, with Lebanon, with Hezbollah. But it's very good that President Biden went and Rishi Sunak has been around the region. The thing that went wrong was the cancellation of the meeting of Arab leaders that was meant to happen with President Biden in Jordan. That was cancelled because of the the terrible um, explosion at a hospital in Gaza, which was instantly blamed on Israel, although so far we're still waiting for the definitive evidence, but so far the evidence is the other way, that it was mm. not actually Israel's fault. But that was a, a mistake by the Arab leaders to cancel that mm. meeting. It made it more important that our prime minister went around the region afterwards. But coming back to that hospital and the way that that was seized on the, the suggestion that it was Israel initially and then, you know, as you say, it's pointing the other way, but we still don't know for sure, um, shows how on edge the region is. What are your thoughts, William, on the risk of this spreading that Hezbollah gets involved? And what are the implications of that if it does? Well, there is a clear risk uh, of that, although clearly they were not coordinated with Hamas. So the... Um, the greatest military impact they could have made would have been to attack Israel at the same time uh, and to take Israel by surprise. So they clearly were not coordinated with Hamas. Um, they will make their own calculation of whether it would be in their interests to get involved in, in the war. Um, uh, they'll be, who knows what calculation they will make that risk all the time. There is a Gaza um, military operation going on, which presumably will be for some weeks uh, now into the future. There will always be a risk of a new front opening in Lebanon as well. And if that happens, uh, well, then this this is where all this international diplomacy that's going on comes in and you start to see whether it was worthwhile because what's really important then is that Iran has received the message it has to stay out um, because it's if Israel and Iran are in direct military conflict that then you have the whole region uh, involved in a wider war. I did an interview with the IDF spokesman earlier and it was interesting because he seemed to suggest he, he they wouldn't be rushed in starting their ground invasion and the one consideration clearly at the top of their considerations was the fate of those hostages. William, do you think that that does have an impact potentially delaying a ground invasion or is that coming down the track very soon in your view? Well, I think there have been several reasons why a ground invasion hasn't started yet, but this is definitely one of them. There are other, there's been, uh, there's been bad weather actually for one thing. Um, uh, there's also been the need for, from the Israeli side to prepare a pretty large army, many of whom are reservists who are being called up. They also have to decide exactly what their military tactics and objectives are going to be. But then, yes, there's this very big uh, factor of there are about 200 people who are held hostage. I, we've learned today that I think about 20 of them are children. Uh, many of them are old and sick people. So this is one of the barbaric outrages that has taken place. And clearly there have been some international negotiations going on behind the scenes of whether some of those hostages, uh, particularly if they might be, if they're dual nationals and some could be released. Um, hopefully if they were children or uh, sick, that they could be released. Do you so think there's any some... chance of that, you know? Well, I, I would imagine that... The, I think that it's definitely worth trying. Um, but of course, the demands that might be made in return for that, the reason Hamas took those innocent people as hostages is in order to trade them for a very, very high price. Right. Uh, 
indeed 10 years ago when one Israeli corporal was released, a negotiation uh, uh, took place for him to be released. 1,000 Palestinian prisoners were released in return. Mm. So, um, a very, so while it may be unlikely, that is important to do. And I'm sure for the Israelis, as they put together their plans, how they try to rescue those hostages is high in their minds. That's very difficult to do, as the sad truth, in, yeah. a, in a massive military operation.